Great. Um, so I am, my name is Professor um, Asal Bali. I teach here at the law school at UCLA, and I'm delighted to be convening this panel, which is the first of the programs of the Critical Race Studies program for the year uh, here at UCLA. And we are absolutely delighted to have such a wonderful turnout. I'm going to say a couple of words just about the framing of this event and about the sort of rules of the road for the question and answer session up front. And then when the presentations have ended, I will resume my role then as moderator of the question and answer session. Uh, but to begin with, and as I hope many of you are aware by now, because you've picked up the packets, and if you haven't, please be aware that there are packets that are handouts concerning the event, which offer several things that are of interest. One is detailed bios of the panelists, which I will not be reading aloud, so please feel free to take a look at the packet to get the detailed biographies of the speakers for this evening, but also a couple of articles that help explain why we have the particular framing that we've chosen for this evening. And I also want to direct your attention to the Critical Race Studies Program website um, at the UCLA School of Law website, and specifically our My Law page. So for those of you who are students, you'll know exactly what I'm referring to, where we have additional materials that you can look at, which sort of not only lay out the framing itself, but also interrogate that framing in a variety of ways that might be of interest to you. But we've included at least a couple of articles in the packet to enable you to engage in this discussion with us by offering to you examples drawn from the popular press of how the Gaza to Ferguson connection came to get made. So this was a connection that emerged organically in some respects from the ground, from activists in Ferguson and in Palestine, although not necessarily in Gaza, but rather in the West Bank, where activists had access to internet in Gaza that had made it very difficult for Gazans to access um, the internet. And what emerged was a connection through social media and through social media platforms from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram to more that gave an opportunity for activists that were separated by thousands of miles and had had no previous connection to one another to connect around specifically the use of tear gas, but more generally questions of the deployment of police force, the use of militarized um, policing techniques, and many other topics that became a sort of um, open forum, if you want, on social media, which was then subsequently picked up by the popular media and later in commentary and analysis about what it was that generated the resonances that had caused these activists to connect to one another across <coughs> such a wide expanse of space and through what are ultimately quite disparate experiences, but in which they found some resonances. So one of our goals today on this panel is to look carefully at exactly what can be learned, what benefits there may be in thinking through this comparison, a comparison which emerged in part because the headlines this summer from July to August were seized by first the images of the civilian casualties and civilian infrastructure damage and just the toll of the war that was taking place in Gaza and then by the events that unfolded in Ferguson following um, the shooting of Michael Brown. So these were two quite distinct sets of headlines, but they were contemporaneous, and that generated the context in which these activists made these connections, which then became a subject that was framed in the popular imagination by media and by commentary. So how can we interrogate this? What is there to be learned by drawing this connection? And what may be obscured by suggesting that there's an analogy here or that there are connections here? And these are part of the sort of themes that we hope to interrogate and we have assembled tonight I think the, uh, an amazingly gifted group of panelists who are the perfect candidates to engage in this conversation and to think through both the benefits of thinking in this connected way and putting questions in particular of race that emerged in Ferguson in a global context and also troubling these connections and troubling the idea that these analogies can hold or asking what else may lie beyond the connection that's drawn between these two contexts. As I've suggested, this is a set of themes that emerged both from the ground and then were picked up and disseminated not only through social media but through traditional media. And they have generated not just con conversation but also controversy. And we understand that the topics that we're going to engage with tonight are controversial across a host of different um, spectrums of perspectives. And we welcome all of those perspectives here 
in general, UCLA Law welcomes an incredibly broad array of perspectives, and specifically the Critical Race Studies program is open at all times to engage with every conceivable audience who's interested in the project that we are advancing. We're going to start this, obviously, panel by turning to the presenters, each of which have been selected to give a 10 to 15 minute presentation of their thoughts in connection with the theme of the panel. And then we're gonna turn to a question and answer period in which we invite all perspectives to be heard, but within certain ground rules, including that you will be recognized by me, by the moderator, when you come up to these microphones in order. And priority is going to be given to students which is always the case at uh, UCLA on this campus in general, but specifically at UCLA Law in public events. We would like to prioritize giving students an opportunity to raise their voices. And then the rules are the general rules that we always have of basic decorum, which is that you should listen respectfully when others are speaking and have the floor, and you should also be considerate when you have the floor, specifically considerate of the fact that we are going to limit questions and comments to one minute per questioner or commentator so that we have an opportunity to open this floor to as many questions and comments as we can within the time frame that we have available. So with that, I'm going to turn now to introduce the panelists in the order that they're going to be presenting with extraordinarily truncated bios that in no way reflect the incredibly distinguished group that we've brought together. And as a result, again, I just refer you to the packets with the complete bios, but I'm just gonna to touch on one or two things that will enable you to place each of these panelists um, as they begin. So Cheryl Harris, will be our first uh, panelist, is a professor here at UCLA Law and needs no introduction for the vast majority, I would think, of this audience. But she is the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties at the UCLA School of Law. And this year, she's also serving as the director of the Critical Race Studies Program. The next speaker will be Hedy Epstein, who is immediately to um, Cheryl's left for me and right from the perspective of the audience. Um, Hedy is many things. Uh, but amongst those things, the things that might be most relevant for you to know is that she's a Holocaust survivor who has been a long-term activist on causes including fair housing, abortion rights, anti-war organizing, civil and human rights, and social justice. She's based in Missouri. She's a native of Missouri, and she was recently arrested in St. Louis at a demonstration related to the events in Ferguson, and that really is a touchstone for her comments, both as a Missourian and as someone who's been involved in solidarity activism of the kind that emerged between Ferguson activists and Palestinian activists that led to the theme of tonight's panel. Um, next, after uh, Hedy Epstein's presentation, is Professor Donna Murch, who's a professor of history at Rutgers, where her research focuses on African American history and 20th century urban struggles. She, too, is a uh, has family and, and long-standing connections in Missouri, and she has just returned from a trip to Ferguson where she conducted extensive interviews with activists on the ground, and will get the benefit of her perspective based on that ethnographic work. Following Professor Murch is Professor Shireen Se'ali, who is a professor of history at the University of California, Santa Barbara, with a focus on the modern Middle East. She is so gracious to have joined us for this panel because she has just arrived less than 24 hours ago from Cairo, Egypt. So she's joining us with tremendous jet lag. Um, but her research interests encompass the 20th century history of Israel-Palestine and will, of course, be very germane to that component of our discussion. And finally, Professor Robin Kelly, again, who may need no introduction to this audience, is uh, the Distinguished Professor of History and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in United States History at UCLA, and his research explores the history of social movements in the United States, the African di diaspora in Africa, among many, many other topics. Once again, I refer you to the full bios of all of these panelists because I've done nothing like justice to their incredible accomplishments, but in the interest of time and beginning exactly on time, since I was allotted my own short five minutes, I'm going to turn to Professor Harris for the first presentation. Thank you, Oslo, and thank you all for coming. I'm really very interested in tonight's conversation and looking forward to it. Days after the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, on August 11th, a 25-year-old mentally ill black man by the name of Ezel Ford was killed by the Los Angeles Police Department in South Los Angeles as he walked near his home. The police claimed that as they stopped their car and attempted to speak to him, he kept walking and, quote, made suspicious movements, including attempting to conceal his hands. <clears throat> they said when they moved towards him, he tackled one of them and reached for his, their gun, 
and that they simply exercised self-defense in shooting him, including shooting him in the back. Neighbors in the area had a very different account. They reported that when they saw the police approach him, they yelled that he has mental problems. They also noted that his mental condition was well known to people in the area, including other police. Nevertheless, uh, uh, moreover, I should say, at least one witness directly contradicts the police account that Ezell assaulted the police before they fired. Days after the murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, police shot and killed another victim, also well known in the community for man having mental health issues, after he was accused by a local storekeeper of stealing a couple of bottles of soda. The videotape on YouTube shows as the man walked toward the police car with his hands at his side, they opened fire. On September 9th, the Huffington Post reported 13 killings by the police of black Latino men and women in the past month. The Malcolm X grassroots movement reported a uh, report on extrajudicial killings contends that a black person is murdered by the police, vigilantes like George Zimmerman, or security guards every 28 hours. And this, of course, is only a partial accounting of the violence. There are other severe but other non-lethal forms of violence, beatings, arrests, so pervasive as to become routine. So what are we to make of the situation? Well, first, consider what we might not make of it. One, that it is the result of individual decisions or mistakes. Mm -hmm. Two, that it is preventable if people would only train better. Three, that it is a regrettable but misguided to focus so much attention on it when the majority of black people are killed by other black people. Four, that some of the shooters, like Zimmerman, are people of color. Five, that race has little to do with it since none of the people involved have ever claimed a racist motive and some of the shooters, like Zimmerman, um, say, we, I am a person of color. This all demonstrates the imperatives of why we need to get beyond race. And six, that these killings are the product of local racial conditions. Instead, let's consider what we might from an alternative point of view. One, this pattern is the result of individual decisions, true, but they are shaped by a history and a present of a racial lo in which a racial logic um, condemns not just individual black people, but the entire group. Through a racialized framework, the group is presumptively dangerous, presumptively criminal, and requires the use of overwhelming force to contain. This is something that social science and cognitive psychology demonstrate repeatedly. Second, while training may make individuals more aware and smarter, fundamental change in this lethal racial equation of massive police power and black men, women, and children is ultimately a question of political power and will require the transformation of the entire social order, otherwise reform efforts inevitably wane in the face of newly articulated security threats. Training police about handling mentally disabled people and addressing bias are absolutely crucial, but they cannot substitute for the long-term questions as the targets will simply shift as racial hegemony updates itself and accommodates to change. In addition to blackness remaining a mark to be overcome, the question will be who will be the new black. That the violence committed within black communities by black people on other black people is true. It is, however, not isolated from the violence perpetuated and sanctioned by the state, which devalues black life and ultimately subjects all to premature death, either by bullet, by neglect, or by disease. All of the toxic conditions under which too many black children live have predictable and documented consequences regarding the normalization of violence. It is the language, says Fanon, in which the oppressed may speak, given the suppression of their voice in other ways. But beyond this, the existence and perpetuation of these conditions justifies the violence used to contain racially subordinated communities. As lawless communities and lawless people, we legitimate the use of what Robert Cover has called the violence of the law to discipline not only the individual transgressor, but to authorize the use of greater state power of surveillance, intrusion, regulation, containment, and subjugation more broadly. As Cover once said, legal interpretation takes place in a, pain, in a field of pain and death, 
legal interpretive acts signal and occasion the imposition of violence upon others. The massive use of force is authorized, it's often used discriminately, not only on the lawless, but on the ordinary. And that indiscriminate use is justified as necessary, and the damage that it causes is excused. Mistaken identity, collateral damage, all of these are terms that normalize this extraordinary use of power. Also, the logic of colorblindness itself that suggests that race plays no role unless the shooter signs an affidavit to that effect, <laughs> sets the stage for the continuation of racialized violence as it sustains deniability, however implausible. While ra finally, while racial conditions are always specific and local, they are always part of a broader global context. Just as slavery was a globalized economic system, so too was the racial logic of white supremacy that legitimated and sustained it. This is what William Patterson and the Civil Rights Congress understood when in 1951 they filed a petition to the United Nations charging the United States government with genocide against the Negro people. As the petition put it, quote, out of the inhuman black ghettos of American cities, out of the cotton plantations of the South, comes this record of mass slayings on the basis of race, of lives deliberately warped and distorted by the willful creation of conditions making for premature death, poverty, and disease. It is a record that calls aloud for condemnation, for an end to these terrible injustices that constitute a daily and ever-increasing violation of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crimes of Genocide. It is sometimes incorrectly thought that genocide means the complete and definitive destruction of a race or people. The Genocide Convention, however, adopted by the General Con Assembly, defines genocide as the killing on the basis of race, or, in specific words, killing members of a group. Any intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a group is genocide, according to the Convention. Thus, the Convention states that causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to members of the group is genocide, as well as killing members of that group. We maintain, therefore, that the oppressed Negro citizens of the United States, segregated, discriminated against, and long the target of violence, suffer from genocide. The petition went on to specify the evidence in support of the claim, specifically invoking an analogy to the crimes committed by Hitler. It also said, quote, white supremacy at home makes for colored massacres abroad. Both reveal contempt for human life and colored skin. It further specifically cataloged many cases of police violence and extrajudicial killings. Of course, as we know, the petition was not heard or decided. Its proponents were denounced as extreme, crazy, communist. That's equivalent, basically. <laughs> <coughs> many, like Paul Robeson, were blackballed. And all of this had profound consequence for the civil rights movement itself, which was forced to cleave itself from what was deemed its too radical internationalist fringe, putting the issue of the fight for justice back into the domestic closet. Of course, three years later, in Brown itself, this proved impossible, as the State Department's brief in the case argued against de jure segregation because of its negative foreign policy international implications. The fight for hearts and minds in the emerging nations of Africa and Asia against the influence of the Soviet Union, the State Department said, would fail if the United States could not jettison at least its more blatant racial exclusionary policies. Um, Mary Dudziak, in a, in a well-known book called Desegregation as Cold War Imperative, actually goes into the archive to demonstrate how and why the State Department ultimately came to make this argument. We can debate whether the evidence the Congress submitted established the crime. We can also challenge the analogy. What I believe we can say, however, is that the situation in Ferguson or Los Angeles or New York is not a purely local domestic question regarding race and power standing outside the broader global currents in which race and power are always implicated. Inevitably, analogies are proximate, imprecise, they sometimes illuminate and they sometimes fail. But importantly, they are claims always contested, not about equivalencies, but about similarities, about how race matters. Thank you. Barbara, you can begin and we'll start the um, I sometimes have been asked, um, how do I get speaking engagements? Do I have an agent? 
No, I don't have an agent. <laughs> and this time I can add the reason why I've been invited to come and speak here is because I was arrested and because of that headline that said 90-year-old Holocaust survivor 90-year-old Holocaust survivor arrested in St. Louis. Um, so thank you very much <laughs> for inviting me. <laughs> Let me just briefly describe the arrest situation to you. A friend of mine called me, who knows that I don't drive anymore, and said, um, would you like to, me to pick you up for this event downtown in St. Louis? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. And so, so I didn't even take my cell phone with me because my friend will have a cell phone and I won't need it. And I, uh, we gathered downtown in a public plaza and then walked a little more than a block to the Wayne Wright Building, which is a state building uh, where the governor of Missouri, Governor Nixon, has his office. And we, our intent was to speak to Governor Nixon and ask him to de-escalate the situation, the very uh, serious situation, the very violent situation in Ferguson. Um, when we arrived there, and there's a little plaza in front of the building where we congregated, but when we arrived there, the doors were, uh, blo were blocked by police and by security people. And um, some of the people in the group, and we were about 200, talked about um, what happened, what their experiences have been in Ferguson and maybe in other places also. And then a police lieutenant came out of the building and uh, informed us that the governor is not in his office, that his staff is not in his office. Uh, and this was on a Sunday afternoon around 3 or 3.30, uh, where regular office hours are, where people can come and go freely in that building. I've gone in there on several occasions in the past myself, but we were confronted with the police blocking the area. And shortly afterwards, the, the police lieutenant announced that we should disperse. And I could just feel the tension rising, and I saw the police, how they straightened themselves up. And I knew something was going to happen momentarily, and it did. A policeman grabbed my arm and put it, put it behind my back, and I was handcuffed, uh, as were uh, eight others, uh, some of whom I knew and some I didn't know. Uh, the woman standing right next to me was visiting Ferguson, and she was from New York. Uh, we were taken to the nearby paddy wagon, taken to a police substation nearby, and after they took all the vital information from us, where, where we lived, where we were born, when we were born, etc., we were told we were free to go. However, we have a citation, and we have to appear before court on August 20th first at three o'clock in the afternoon. The charge is failure to disperse. Um, I want to come back briefly to the, the uh, subheading or the title of, of many newspaper and, um, and emails, etc., which was 90-year-old Holocaust survivor arrested. Um, I don't know who's in the audience, but if there are members of the Jewish community here, who some of whom sometimes protest against my being a Holocaust survivor, uh, ch challenging me, saying I'm not a Holocaust survivor. I'm not going to argue with you about this, because I can give you a citation of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., which I guess is a recognized authority. And they say anyone who was ever uh, living under the Hitler regime, under the Nazi regime, is a Holocaust survivor. And I lived under the Nazi regime in Germany from 1933 until 1939. So if you have problems with my, um, that I'm being called a Holocaust survivor, take it up with the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Don't take it up with me. <laughs> and now to my more formal presentation. <laughs> um, to begin with, let me give you a brief description of the two entities contained in the title of this panel, 
and from Gaza to Ferguson. Ferguson is a suburb of the city of St. Louis until recently has sometimes been referred to as a sleepy little community with its own governmental structure, police and fire departments, which ignored the long simmering anger and frustration of a significant component, the African American community in, this, in, this, uh, in Ferguson. Gaza, the West Bank, and Jerusalem are occupied territories occupied by Israel. Israel has argued it ceased occupying Gaza in 2005, yet Gaza continues to be occupied by Israel. As an occupying power, Israel is obligated under the Geneva Convention to ensure the well-being of the Palestinian population. Gaza is considered occupied territory under international law because Israel continues to control Gaza's borders, its airspace, and territorial waters, as well as all activity of goods and people. From the death and destruction in Israel's latest war on Gaza to the dramatic arrival of the National Guard on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, there have been many brutal reminders on display of the violence that underpins racial hierarchies in Israel, in Ferguson, and in the United States. With U.S. military and political aid continuing to flow to Israel and Israel's contribution to U.S. techniques of control, the politics of discrimination, of incarceration, of hatred and fear in both areas, despite their distinct histories and contexts, are not only parallel but connected. Israel has and continues to play a role in the militarization of U.S. police, to which recently in Ferguson. The former Ferguson police chief received training in Israel on how to control large numbers of people. Military equipment used in Iraq and Afghanistan has been given by our federal government to lo local police, not only in Missouri, not only in Ferguson, but all over the United States. Some of these weapons have been used against the residents of Ferguson. Missouri State Police has proved that they're willing and able to turn military-grade equipment against people they've sworn to protect. This made a volatile situation much more dangerous and created a perception of a town under siege. That is unacceptable. Representative Henry or Hank Johnson from Democrat, a Democrat from Georgia, will or by now maybe already has introduced a piece of legislation, the Stop Militarization Law Enforcement Act, which would limit what surplus military equipment can be sent to our police forces across the United States. The interconnected events of this summer, the summer of 2014, have brought a collective moment of clarity. Ferguson, Gaza, the U.S. border. The African American people in Ferguson are treated like other African American people all over this country, like Palestinians in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. They are the other. The disregard and the disrespect for African Americans is endemic to the white supremacist system in this country and it's endemic to the Palestinians who wrote in social media to the Ferguson American community, African American community, quote, your struggle through the ages has been an inspiration to us as we fight daily for the basic human dignities in our homeland, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, against the racist Zionist regime that considers us, quote, less human. <coughs> People in Gaza, in the midst of their struggle to survive, advised the people of Ferguson on social media how to deal with tear gas, the very same tear gas that Israel uses against Palestinians when they peacefully, nonviolently protest against all aspects of Israel's occupation of Palestine, of Palestinian people and land. An organization representing the rights of Palestinian prisoners published a statement in solidarity with the people of Ferguson, stating, quote, 
Samitun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network salutes the people of Ferguson, joins their call for justice for Michael Brown and for an end to police up oppression, mass incarceration, and militarization, and stands in solidarity with black movements struggling for justice and liberation." End quote. Racial disparities in our, the U.S. justice system, contribute to the stigmatization, especially of black men as criminals. The racial and or ethnic disparities in the Israeli justice system contribute to the stigmatization of, of especially Palestinian men as terrorists. This stigmatization in both places creates a climate of injustice, fear, and hate. And inevitably, these sentiments are reflected in the way black neighborhoods and Palestinians respectively, in the way police, the Israeli military, and government interact with these respective communities. It is the role of the police in both places and the Israeli military as an occupying power to protect the communities and stop the proliferation of crime. It should not be the Israeli military and U.S. police acting like militia to take peaceful assemblies and to attack peaceful assemblies and demonstrations. This leads to a dangerous situation. Operating under these assumptions that African Americans commit crimes and Palestinians are terrorists, they both become targets in a hunting ground. Israeli policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians is not going to change on its own. Pol police policy in Ferguson in the United States is also not going to change on its own. It's going to take a movement, and we the people have to build it together. I see the beginnings of that in Ferguson. Sadly, Michael Brown had to give up his life for that to happen. We all can make a difference. In fact, we all have a responsibility to make a difference happen. It started to happen the night before Michael Brown's funeral as we stood on the steps of the old courthouse in downtown St. Louis, in that very place where Dred Scott sued, sued for his freedom and was denied his citizenship and his humanity by our legal system in 1857. Enough of us got the message that the gun violence in Ferguson was crossing the divide, and it was time for us to do more than talk. It was time to end the illusion of separation in America. Two Americas, two Fergusons, Israelis versus Palestinians. It will take all of us together to change this culture, all of us to challenge racial and ethnic profiling, all of it the poison of racism that sickens all of us here and over there in Palestine and in Israel. I marched and protested in the Israeli-occupied West Bank together with the young Palestinian people, peacefully, nonviolently, protesting the occupation and all that it entails. I watched the young people in Ferguson who emerged to keep peace on the streets as only they can. These young people know firsthand how the militarization of local police forces are a direct form of oppression and present a grave danger in their lives and in their community. They did their best to keep the peace, to keep us safe on the streets, with the protests by directing traffic and giving out water on those very hot summer nights. And now they're focused in Inter Alia on registering uh, everyone to vote. They have been awakened, and I hope that their empowerment will bring a change in the status quo, the business as usual. And it is, a, it is a, upon us to support them, to support the community, free contain, fr businesses that have struggled since Michael Brown's death, or I guess I should say his murder. I had lunch up there the other day and had the best veggie burger I ever had. <laughs> So come to Ferguson, have veggie burger. <laughs> uh, these acts matter, and they may tip the scales. Beyond that, 
there need to be institutional changes, changes in the systemic racism that has brought us to this time and place. Difficult questions need to be asked about res responsibility and how this tra tragedy could have been avoided. Furthermore, we here in St. Louis or in Ferguson must challenge all of America to find your own Ferguson, finding that seemingly sleepy suburb that is, that is ready to erupt and work towards healing the divide. We also must challenge the people of Israel, their government and their military to discuss, discard their prejudices about the Palestinians in the Israeli occupied West Bank, Gaza and Jerusalem and honestly and sincerely work towards peace for all of the people, Palestinians and Israelis. On behalf of the people in Ferguson and the Palestinians, I ask you all to stand with them, not only in words, but in deeds. As I said earlier, we all have a responsibility to do so. Regardless of our differences, we are one people, one human race. Thank you. Good evening. Um, the piece I'm going to present today is part of a larger work called It's About the Right to Exist, The Politics of Analogy and the Struggle on West Florissant. I'd like to start just by thanking Asla Bali uh, for putting together tonight's event and for all of her wonderful programming on Middle East studies. Um, I've been in residency at UCLA for a year and I've been regularly going to the events and she's just done a, a remarkable job building academic community and, and, um, uh, and, and really uh, creating a, a, a space for dialogue. Donna, I think you come to the mic. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Is that better? Um, I just also like to say it's a real privilege for me to be on a panel with some of my own personal heroes and I can't imagine a group of people that I would rather hear talk about the meaning of linking Operation Protective Edge, the most recent bombing and ground invasion of Gaza, to the shooting of Michael Brown and the heavily militarized confrontation with young protesters in the weeks that followed. Uh, today I'm mainly going to talk about Ferguson and the broader communities in St. Louis City and County and thinking about how this raises points of comparison. Better? Yeah, it's directional. You've got to speak right into it. Okay. Yeah. How is this? I'll get very, very close. <laughs> close like Beyonce to the microphone. <laughs> um, <laughs> And thinking about how this raises points of comparison, politics of analogy, and most importantly, creates new opportunities for mobilizing domestic and international solidarity with Palestinian statelessness and dispossession. While I was in St. Louis, I was there for a week. My entire extended family lives there. I was really struck by how many people talked about statelessness. So I'm going to weave that throughout my presentation as well as talking about the concrete politics of solidarity that were created through tweets um, from the West Bank explaining to, to people how to deal with tear gas who'd never, ever encountered it before. In the case of the Palestinian people, this work of doing of international solidarity I think is particularly urgent given the historical importance of international support, solidarity and transnational networks in making their call for statehood and at a more personal level personhood both visible and viable. Similarly for African Americans the internationalization of their struggle for inclusion and citizenship has always been a crucial political mode ranging from some of the examples that Cheryl gave Paul Robeson's activism, William Patterson's We Charge Genocide, Martin Luther King's Riverside Speech, and through the radical intercommunalism and internationalism of the Black Panther Party. This was particularly true during the Cold War civil rights movement in which shaming American democracy abroad provided crucial domestic leverage at home. And as I was thinking about this presentation, I spent a lot of time thinking about how African-American politics of internationalization worked during the Cold War and what a different period we're in now, post-Cold War, where we're really dealing with um, 
U.S. military dominance and hegemony and unilateral action, and yet we're still seeing uh, internationalization of African-American struggle. So um, as we see today in the unipolar unilateral world of the U.S. military dominance, d the desire to internationalize and to identify with subjects and victims of U.S. militarism abroad remains. I would argue that at its core, this close identification of African Americans is informed by a deep structure of feeling that looks to and identifies with Palestinians in their confrontation with a highly militarized exclusionary racial state. So this concept of a racial state is one that we use in the university, but I think increasingly is being taken up by young people as understood in that way, and that's what's creating some of the commonsensical analogy between Palestine and the U.S. for this, I would say, a new generation, really, of protesters and activists in Ferguson and Sanford and, and increasingly across the country. In the words of Reverend Kenneth McCoy, a local AME pastor from Progressive Zion in North St. Louis, who I met at a demonstration in Ferguson in front of the St. Louis City Department of Justice, quote, we here in this community have lived here pretty much under martial law. We are boxed in. They continue to treat us as if we are not citizens of the United States. They treat us as if we are alien enemy combatants. And after you have spent your whole life paying taxes, citizens of this community deserve more. He went on to link this experience of dispossession and dehumanization to the recent events in Gaza. Quote, the same kind of overarching excessive use of force, perhaps not to the extent of the loss of life in Gaza, but the same attitude is here, that people do not have the right to exist. Mike Brown's murder is about the right to exist, just the right to exist. I think we share that with the people of Gaza. God gave us the right to exist. This is something beyond politics. All we want is justice, powers that be to honor their laws. So often, when it comes to people of color throughout the world, they tend to rewrite the laws about the right to exist or not to exist. So I'm going to focus on two major themes in my talk. The first is the meaning and impact of mili militarization and counterinsurgency in the history of policing in the U.S., and I'm really only going to talk about the modern period, the past 50 years, since the social upheaval of the 1960s and 1970s. It's obviously a longer history, but that'll be my focus. And how we might view this recent battle in Ferguson as part of a long durée of state repression against black and brown people in the U.S. And from there, to think about how we might connect this to the war crimes committed in Gaza this summer. The second area I want to focus on is the aftermath of conflict. On the social, mo on the social movement politics and organizing on the ground, in the twilight of the National Guard, the armed personnel carriers, the M16s, and the military hardware that was deployed against ordinary citizens. One of the great challenges for mobilization, both in Ferguson and in Gaza, is to keep world attention on the everyday, quotidian experiences of residents after the spectacular military confrontations have receded and the issues of power and dominance are less clear. And this is a theme that I heard over and over from many different groups in Ferguson saying that protesting is normal. To, to object is normal. What is not normal are our everyday lives that we can't drive down West Florissant, that there are three times as many warrants being issued as the black population of Florissant, that the everyday is not normal, protest is normal. Military assaults in the moment of attack create incredible unity. However, as spectacular displays uh, recede, Fissures often appear in coalitions, and over the long run, violent engagement is often polarizing and destructive in its effects. So one of the things that's happening in Ferguson right now is that what was a very strong coalition is beginning to fracture into different tendencies. And some of it's based on class, some of it's based on the social and political opportunities that are created by all of the attention to Ferguson, and then another piece on state incorporation. So I think that uh, both in Gaza and in Ferguson, the, the question of after math is very important, not only focusing on the moment of violent conflict itself. I just wanted to say a few words about St. Louis because it has a very special meaning to me. My entire extended family lives there and I actually considered writing a PhD dissertation on St. Louis and instead decided to write about Oakland. 
And one of the reasons I did that is that I was researching Black St. Louis about 20 years ago, and I started in looking at the period right after the East St. Louis race riot, and I found a story that was really a devastating story. It had a very strong environmental component with the early chemical industry um, around World War I, and the real mobilization of white labor and white labor unions into some of the most brutal forms of, of racial violence. And I was really looking for a story of change and transformation. And while St. Louis certainly had a civil rights movement, I think in many ways it was quite limited. And you didn't see the kind of black power movement, black radical movement that you saw in a city like Oakland. So um, I have to say that even though I'm a daughter of St. Louis, I have often used it as a foil. So there is particular pleasure and joy that I take to see what's happening in St. Louis and Ferguson. I think it's truly remarkable. St. Louis is a, I consider it to be a very socially conservative city. It's a city that's very stratified by race. It's also intensely stratified by color and class within the African and American community. And the idea that St. Louis could be ground zero of a youth mobilization to really try to dismantle the police state and to think more broadly about mass incarceration and criminalization for me is remarkable. So I think if Ferguson and St. Louis are capable of doing this, everywhere <laughs> is capable of doing this. You know, as Eldridge Cleaver said, one, two, three Vietnams, one, two, three, four, infinite uh, Fergusons. So I think um, the site of St. Louis as, as a site of mobilization is uh, really quite wonderful. Um, okay, so I just want to start by talking a little bit about militarization and counterinsurgency. I think it's safe to say that the state uh, provoked the conflict in Ferguson, it's very clear. And they did this in two ways. The first, it was the murder of Mike Brown, an unarmed 17-year-old, but also very important was leaving his body in the street for four to five hours. That symbolism of, of that abandoned body in the street is really what mobilized people. So I don't just think it's the killing. I think that it's the real attempt to inflict a politics of terror on the population of Canfield Green that mobilized people. And many people that I interviewed talked about this. Interestingly enough with social media, people even living in the complex, many of them first saw his body on social media inside their apartments, came outside, then began taking pictures, tweeting it to other people in St. Louis. So I think that that image, it's a, you know, a profound image of terror. It immediately evokes, uh, and people have made the analogy to the authoritarian death squads um, in anti-communist regimes in the 80s and 90s, and also it harkens back to a history of lynching. Um, Um, as, okay, so I think that this image of Michael Brown, um, I think that for this new generation, it plays a role very much like the open casket funeral uh, that Mamie Till staged for Emmett Till. It's an image that has been burned into people's consciousness, and it's become a real source of inspiration for political organizing. And like the image of Emmett Till for the civil rights and black power generations, Michael, Gr Michael Brown has become emblematic of police violence and militarization against black communities. And I would say also given the mobilization, I think we're now in day 39, of the will to fight back. Mm -hmm. And I think Ferguson, the fighting back in Ferguson is also the reason that we are here talking about Ferguson. And we might think about that, how that corresponds to um, what's happening and what, what has happened in Gaza um, most recently. As crowds gathered on the following Sunday and Monday after Michael Brown's murder, police deployed in combat uniforms and tanks, armed personnel carriers with military assault rifles, including M16, massive use of tear gas near Canfield Green and nearby uh, North Wind Apartments meant residents were trapped, including Ferguson State Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal and her staff. It was at this point that protesters received tweets from Gaza and the West Bank about how to make home gas masks and to use milk or Coca-Cola rather than to wash out their eyes and blunt respiratory effects. 
An important point I want to make about this is that it was not media generated. This was not a media generated top down story. I interviewed many protesters who were there for the first week in the confrontation with St. Louis City, County, and Ferguson police, and they vividly described how helpful the advice and directives were from Palestinians. So I think that this um, bottom up story is, a, is an important one. Um, I want to show you a few of the images from uh, from Gaza, uh, from, excuse me, from Ferguson. This is the uh, initial um, Mike Brown's body. There have been a series of these altars that have been built that have changed mm -hmm. day by day, uh, memorializing his, fa his murder. Here's um, roses were laid on the grave. This famous image. Um, the signs uh, describing it as an occupation appear throughout the different protests. Um, an important link, I think, also to talking about Gaza is the reclamation of childhood, of emphasizing that Michael Brown was a child, emphasizing his age, and really uh, talking about um, the importance of, of children, that this highlighting the cruelty and brutality and militarization of the state by the ways in which it has attacked children. So I think this has been a, a shared strategy. Here you can see that um, it was very common for people to leave toys at the site of the murder. School bus. Now, uh, this is something very specific that I found in going through Canfield Green which is that um, there's been a systematic policy of chopping down the trees that surround the apartment complex where Michael Brown was murdered. And one of the residents had an analysis of this that I wanted to play. It's just a 30 second clip. No, no, I'm, I'm actually that trying that to show a clip. Yeah, that one. Here we are. It's hard to do it from yeah. the table backwards. Can't do the point where I'm shot. Right here, where you shot it, where Chloe shot it down, where we shot it down. And you were telling me about the tree. I see a lot of trees that have been chopped down. Mm-hmm. They shot them down there. You get a better view so they can make more for us right here and out here. So they're chopping down all the trees. They chop down all the this trees. This is called Canfield Green, so it's partially named for the trees, yeah. right? We had, they didn't have any trees out here for years now. All of a sudden, it's a good patch of they've been chopping down ones out here. So um, I think that this raises a number, uh, a number of issues. The first is that Ferguson is important for linking wars at home with wars abroad. Historically, organization of, organizations that have sought to do this have faced the greatest state repression. The Black Panther Party and other black radicals' discourse of internal colonization and the use of in imagery that linked U.S. police violence at home with that abroad is very important. Uh, of course, we are in a post-Cold War world, and this new era of international solidarity with Palestinians and other subjects of U.S. and Israeli war and occupation is taking place under a very different set of political constraints. Um, I have a lot more material and a lot more images, but I'm going to sum it up by saying that there's a, essentially a, a movement brewing in Ferguson. There are many different organizations that have been founded by youth, including Justice Corps, the Organization of Black Struggle, which preceded Ferguson, Lost Voices, which is a group that was involved in physical occupations of the protest assembly space, and Hands Up United. Um, their real struggle right now is to keep the issue in the headline, and a big defeat, I think, has been the movement of the grand jury decision until January 7th. So in the same way that ceasefires often would take international attention away from uh, the violence going on in Gaza, this um, moving of the date back 
for uh, Darren Wilson, the grand jury decision on Darren Wilson, Daryl Wilson has really helped to uh, demobilize people. So um, a couple of comparative questions that I would like to put out there for thinking about links between uh, Ferguson and Gaza. The first is, what is the mutual benefit on both sides for using this analogy? How does this historical moment compare with the Panthers and other radical black power organizations' alliance with the PLO at the height of the Cold War and worldwide decolonization? So what does it mean to talk about African American politics in, an international, in, in international terms in a period that's post-Cold War where you no longer have a potential leverage uh, with the Soviet Union? The second is that it has been increasingly common in the US to compare Gaza to the largest open air prison in the world. This clearly reflects a desire for solidarity, but also the search for a deeply resonant example of a militarized, punishing, carceral state. I note that Palestinians are much more likely to use the politics of occupation or settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, are these two fully compatible? And if not, how might we rethink our politics of solidarity? Finally, both Palestinians and uh, people from Gaza are facing difficulty in maintaining world attention on the ground, on the ground, and on the ground mobilization in the aftermath of a violent armed conflict, which can, by definition, help create unity. However, in the long run, the problems of factionalization as well as demobilization are a constant issue. How might we compare strategies on the ground in both Gaza and Ferguson to think about how to further develop solidarity networks and strengthen local movements in both places? And uh, I, I would really like to hear from my, my uh, fellow panelists on this question about how this, what this looks like in Gaza. Thank you. Just double click. I'm a Mac fan, so. It's a slide, go to slideshow at the top. Ah, oh, there we go. From the beginning. Okay. Yay, we got the PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> now to the more fun part. Um, thank you so much, Asla. I'm so honored to be here. Um, really, it's it's every everybody on this panel is um, someone that I've followed and um, inspired by. So I'm really really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about Gaza mostly, and I'm talking a little bit about the idea of an archive. And then I'm going to try to link Gaza to the Arab uprisings and a little bit to Ferguson. And, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of um, fruitful conversation afterwards, and I look forward to it. Beginning at 9 in the evening of 19 July, Israeli tanks, artillery, and missiles pounded the residents of one of the Gaza Strip's poorest and most overcrowded neighborhoods, Shajaya. The Israeli media and its European and US cohorts scripted these people as human shields. With the adjective shield, these media pundits rendered 1.8 million people external to the category of the human. The next morning, the streets of Shaja'iya were lined with corpses. A matriarch with a blood-spattered headscarf cried in shock, my son is dead. A young man lay immobilized in the rubble. He called out to God just before an Israeli sniper killed him. The people who remained fled in terror, racing for their lives under ongoing assault. A dark cloud hung over them as they walked, drove, or rode in wheelchairs away from their homes. On the afternoon of, of 24 July, people taking shelter at a United Nations school in Beit Hanun gathered in the yard to evacuate. Minutes later, a barrage of Israeli artillery shells crashed into the school, killing 16 people and wounding 200. The Israeli army claimed it had given evacuation orders. 
The UN spokesperson Chris Gunness insisted that the UN had called for a lull in the fighting to facilitate evacuation. It was the fourth time Israel hit a UN facility since the start of the so-called Operation Protective Edge. On 27 July, the people of Gaza had a reprise from bombardment. They began sifting through the piles of rubble, searching for the dead. Surrounded by the smell of death, they uncovered another 150 bodies. Others searched for the remnants of their biographies, their books, their photos, their papers. These are but a few of the scenes of Gaza 2014. They are painful in their immediacy, but their familiarity is also a source of injury. And by familiarity, I mean here that they do not belong to this time or place alone. They are instances in what is now the Palestinian censuring-long confrontation with colonialism. They are part of an archive that is the Palestinian condition. In the immediate present, to live in Gaza is to live in perpetual search for refuge. The recent scenes from Gaza conjure formative catastrophes like those of 1948, when 80% of historic Palestine became Israel, when Zionist forces destroyed or depopulated over 400 villages, when 800,000 Palestinians became stateless refugees denied their internationally recognized right of return, when 150,000 Palestinians in what then became Israel became present absentees, that is, strangers on their own land. The scenes from Gaza conjure instances of indiscriminate death at the hands of a superior military force. <clears throat> Israeli officials justify such force on occupied people as quote-unquote retaliation, but they always manifest as collective punishment. The scenes from Gaza conjure the Kibya massacre of 1953, when a then young Ariel Sharon killed 69 residents and reduced 45 homes to rubble. They conjure Sabran Shatila in 1982, when the Israeli army shelled the refugee camps and lit the way for Lebanese phalangists to, to quote-unquote mop up the Palestinians inside. The scenes from Gaza conjure other more mundane moments, house demolitions, land expropriations, target ass assassinations. Israel's most recent assault, we should all note, has resulted in the designation of 44% of the Gaza Strip's land as a buffer zone. This is a historical repeti repetition of the Israeli strategy of land expropriation that has resulted in an ever-shrinking Palestine. For the Palestinians living under occupation in the West Bank, for the Palestinians living in Israel, for Palestinian refugees, for Palestinians in the diaspora, the site of exodus, of displacement, of grief, and of searching for refuge is but another instance of historical repetition in the confrontation with Zionism. Gaza 2014 belongs to the archive of colonialism. On 12 June 2014, a group of Palestinians kidnapped three settler youth. Hours after their capture, Israeli authorities learned that the Palestinians had killed the three youth. Despite this knowledge, the government began the public relations campaign that Hamas was responsible for the kidnapping alongside a state-sponsored incitement against the Palestinian body. Shortly thereafter, on 2 July, Israeli police found the tortured and burnt body of 16-year-old Mohammed Abu Khdir in a Jerusalem forest. Six young Israelis had kidnapped him on his way to prayer, forced him to drink with gasoline, and lit him on fire. In protests, thousands of those one and a half million people subjected to the colonial and injurious label of the quote-unquote Israeli Arab took to the streets from the Nakab in the south to Haifa in the north. Likewise, throughout the non-contiguous Bantustans of the West Bank, Palestinians rose up.
On both sides of the Green Line that partitions historic Palestine, there were pitched battles with the Israeli military and police forces. One side threw rocks, the other side threw tear gas, rubber-coated bullets, live fire, and toxic, quote-unquote, skunk water. It was hard to distinguish between Nazareth and Ramallah, between Tul Karim and Baqa, that is between the West Bank and inside um, Israel. These uprisings are very much part of the present, but they do not belong today, to today alone. They belong to the rebels of 1936-1939, who for a brief moment liberated the cities of Palestine from British rule. They belong to the Fidayeen, or the rebels of the Palestinian Refu Revolution in the 1960s and 70s. They belong to the strikers and marchers who stood up against land confiscation inside Israel on land day in 1976. They belong to the revolutionaries of the First Intifada who faced brutality with civil disobedience. They belong to the stone throwers whose time in Israeli presence prisons became rites of passage. Gaza 2014 belongs to the other part of the archive that is the Palestinian condition, the archive of decolonization. In launching its military experiment on its favorite laboratory, the Gaza Strip, Israel banked on historical repetition and delivered it as the Palestinian death toll mounted. In return, the Palestinians delivered historical rupture. For the first time since 1993, the Palestinians insisted that they would not fall prey to the logic of agree now and negotiate later. They refused the choice between slow and immediate death and demanded an end to the siege of Gaza. In contradistinction to Israel's last two assaults on Gaza in 2009 and 2012, this time the Islamist governing power in Gaza, Hamas, through its daily barrage of unguided rockets, inflicted higher costs than ever before on Israel's far superior military power. Previous narrations of Hamas as irrational and irrelevant no longer worked. Israeli commentators were forced to contend with Hamas' steadfastness in the face of a devastating power imbalance. That steadfastness, if only momentarily, shifted the terms of political discourse across Palestinian factions, political factions, from negotiations to a revitalized focus on resistance. In 2014, Gaza ruptured the historical record. On the evening of 24 July, Palestinians by the thousands across territorial separations braved live fire and rubber-coated bullets. From the Ramallah, they marched to Kalandia. From Nablus, they marched to Hawara. In Hebron, in Bethlehem, in Tul Karim, they confronted Israeli forces. In the Jerusalem suburb of Abu Dis, young men chipped at the separation wall. The symbolic destination was Jerusalem. The concrete outcome was a refusal to submit, a rejection of bifurcation. It would be a misreading of history to designate these mobilizations as pro-Gaza. Of course these Palestinians stood with Gaza, but they understand Gaza as part of their reality, as part of their ongoing confrontation with colonialism. They seized the rupture and they demonstrated for Gaza and for Palestine, beyond, before, and across Israel's machinations of separation. Gaza in July was for many in the Arab world a tragic but powerful moment of resistance where a less equipped and weaker side stood in the face of a far superior military force. For four years, from Tunisia to Saudi Arabia, what the Egyptian activist Hussam Hamalawi has called the visuals of dissent inspired many of us in the Arab wor world to reflect anew on popular politics and uprising. Sadly, we witnessed this invigorating potential rapidly erode either into civil war or into a competition with a new brand of militant Islamism that makes uh, even Al-Qaeda blush. Elsewhere, as in Egypt, we saw the retrenchment of the old regime in refurbished military attire. Back in 2011, Palestine and its politics seemed to be off the grid in comparison to the exciting mass organizing that was taking place in Tunisia and Egypt. 
but by 2014, we had come full circle. Palestine was once again central to the possibility of dissent, a dissent that is motivated by demands for freedom, justice, and above all, self-determination. By the end of July, I've sort of forgotten my PowerPoint here, <laughs> it's okay. By the end of July, the Palestine death toll was over 2,000, and the Israeli death count was 73. Even that stark contrast masks a, far, a reality far worse. Today, Gazans are facing the loss of thousands of lives above those destroyed by Israeli bombs. Life cannot survive in the thorough destruction of basic infrastructure. And one um, passing statistics of this is, is now Gazans are sort of struggling to deal with 2.5 tons of rubble uh, <clears throat> in their daily lives. So what does Gaza have to do with Ferguson? It was in the moment when Gaza was under um, unprecedented assault, even by Israeli standards, that Ferguson erupted in, in protest following the police murder of unarmed 18-year-old Michael Brown. The uprising in Ferguson invigorated the world and Arabs and Palestinians in particular with its powerful model of collective resistance. Today we're focusing on the resonances between Gaza and Ferguson, but there are many other echoes that resound with the Arab uprising more broadly and the struggle against militarization and um, authoritarianism in the Arab world more broadly. We can talk about that in the discussion. Many of these echoes are immediately visible. The lone figure in a cloud of tear gas facing down a tank. The bra bravery of individuals willing to risk life and limb. And the sight of many bodies coming together, if only for a moment, to act as one under the force of military assault. And if you remember, this is an image from Egypt in 2011. Um, and, and it's this kind of collectivity um, that was very striking as a resonance for me. Also shockingly familiar was the US government's profound militarization and transformation of Ferguson into a laboratory for the latest technology and the violent suppression of political dissent. I followed as events unfolded in Ferguson from Cairo, which has been my base for the last five years, and I took part in sharing tips on tear gas and messages of solidarity. Friends and comrades commented on how the US government's militarization of public space resembled Gaza and Cairo. Many suggested, quote, it looks like the United States is taking tips from Israel. This observation was for me a painful reminder of my colleague Maya Mikdashi's argument, quote, that in the United States, settler colonialism has been so complete and so successful that the world has forgotten that South Africa, Australia, and Israel are all reproductions, all approximations of the ongoing victory back home. It is the United States in this scenario that is decidedly the teacher. Most of us know that the United States provides the financial and diplomatic support that but rests Israel's unprecedented impunity in contravening international law, but there is a deeper connection in this relationship, one that can help us understand the very specific link between Gaza and Ferguson, and that is the long and ongoing history of settler colonialism. And I guess I just proved your point that Palestinians um, talk a lot about settler colonialism. Um, to understand both Ferguson and Gaza, we have to recognize both spaces and events not as singular incidences, but as moments in a broader history. Like Gaza, Ferguson is not an isolated moment. We must trace the archive that Ferguson embodies, the archive of institutionalized racism, the archive of the ongoing struggle for liberation. In gathering that archive, we must remember that Native Americans and African Americans are not immigrants or minorities, their constitutive others. Um, they did not land on the United States. The United States landed on them. As David Palumbo Lu has argued, the replenished history of police assaults on black bodies in Ferguson's has congruencies with Gaza in five main arenas. The dispossession from land and home, a structure of de facto inequality and institutionalized racism, state violence, the containment of everyday life, and immunity from prosecution. And while institutionalized exclusion and subjugation undergirded by state violence may resonate across Gaza and Ferguson, the histories that bring us to these respective moments are very distinct. 
We should attend to these differences just as we attend to the strongest common thread that unites them, the ongoing history of settler colonialism and how that history both sustains and legitimizes state violence and oppression. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Let's see. I know time is short, and so I'm going to try to do this. In t I've been sitting here just cutting, cutting, cutting to try to do this in 10 minutes. Uh, so, so forgive me. Um, and I did all everything everyone said in the panel. This is great people, great presentations. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we all know the names and how they died. Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Ezel Ford, Kajima Powell, John Crawford III, Darian Hunt, ad infinitum. They were unarmed and black, shot down by police under circumstances for which lethal force was unnecessary. None of the officers have been charged, and judging from past experiences, a conviction is unlikely. We hold their names like recurring nightmares, accumulated, uh, accumulating the dead like ghoulish baseball cards. Except there's no trading, no forgetting, just perpetual stacks of dead bodies. For the last couple of generations, Oscar Grant, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Stewart, Eula Love, Patrick Dorisman, Malice Green, Taisha Miller, to name a few, have become symbols of racist police violence in the United States. And I'm only speaking of the dead, not the harassed, the beaten, the humiliated, the stopped and frisked, and I'm not just talking about men. I almost declined the invitation for this panel because, quite frankly, I'm tired of documenting and narrating and analyzing and deconstructing racist violence. I'm tired of seeing so many black and brown people die such violent, brutal deaths at the hands of police, security guards, vigilantes, armies with cluster bombs, and drone operators who almost never have to account for their crimes. I don't have the luxury or time or psychic energy to respond again and again to 400 years of state-sanctioned serial murder because I'm busy trying to raise two black boys right now. Fifteen years ago, in the aftermath of Amadou Diallo's execution, shot 41 times as he held up his wallet in terrified compliance, I wrote an essay titled Slanging Rocks Palestinian Style, Dispatches from the Occupied Zones of North America that attempted to put the entire history of racist state violence in a broad historical, con historical context. For the past decade, it is as if I've been rewriting that essay. Only the names change. Last year, Trayvon Martin was the center of the story. This year, it was to be Eric Garner, but put off temporarily in order to focus on Israel's war in Gaza, where the onslaught took an average of 45 Palestinians each day where black people die by bullets and tasers and chokeholds and billy clubs at the hands of the state and private security forces at a stream of every 28 hours, the carnage in the tiny and massively overcrowded Gaza Strip has achieved flood levels. And I can begin names, but if I start naming, we'll be here till tomorrow. Uh, even writing about Gaza, like the wars themselves, felt like deja vu, but I wrote, and as soon as I turned my attention to U.S. domestic state violence, Michael Brown was dead. His killer officer, Darren Wilson, was on paid leave. In the suburb of Ferguson was aflame. And even that wasn't new, because it's worth noting that virtually every single urban insurrection arising out of black communities in the 20th and 21st century was sparked by a case of police misconduct. I mean, go back and look it up. Almost every single one. Now, I'm low to make easy comparisons when it comes to Palestine and black America. I've said it in this room before. Um, because sometimes the context is flattened out. But if we think of the US and Israeli security states uh, not as exceptional, but as part of a global neoliberal racial regime, uh, we see some revealing parallels and relationships. So first, let me address the issue of, of militarization of the police. And by the way, I'm not disagreeing with anyone on the panel. I'm just trying to offer a different perspective uh, on, on this. So much has been made, in, uh, in fact, we just heard this, but much has been made of Israel's role in training US urban police forces and the federal government's role in arming them with surplus military uh, weaponry and combat gear as part of its war on terror. These links are demonstrable and consequential, to be sure, 
but the focus on them sometimes obscures the fact that the modern police force in the U.S. was established as a domestic military force. Uh, Mark uh, Levine actually wrote a very good article about this in uh, Al Jazeera, by the way. Before 9-11, we can go back to the war on drugs, right? We can go back further to the era of U.S. domestic counterinsurgency and the paramilitary operations on social movements, like the Black Panther Party that Donna writes about, um, or efforts to put down and contain riots. Indeed, in 1967, Israeli occupation forces and U.S. urban police forces were studying the same counterinsurgency strategies used in Vietnam because they were dealing with a colonial or semi-colonial set of relationships. But we can go back even further. East St. Louis in 1917, just 12 miles from Ferguson, um, police and local militia joined white mobs in an all-out war on the black community. When the smoke cleared, at least 150 black residents had been shot, burned, hanged, or maimed for life, and about 6,000 were driven from their homes. 39 people, black people, lost their lives, um, including small children, whose skulls were crushed and or were tossed in bonfires. State violence, in other words, has taken militarized form from its inception, scorched earth policy of an indiscriminate shooting by state authorities accompanying vigilantes is a military campaign, whether they're using Smith & Wesson rifles or AR-15s. We have sometimes confused hardware and technology and garb with militarization itself. Israel and the U.S. are touted as models of modern democracy where the military and police are supposed to abide by civilian authority, but instead these institutions operate above the law. They have the authority to investigate themselves or just ignore the law, whether it is refusing to charge Darren Wilson or to stall efforts at an outside investigation by independent civilian review. And here I'm not talking about the Justice Department. I'll get to that later. Um, the IDF continues to be shielded from war crimes uh, investigations, as was the case after the release of the Goldstone Report, exposing a litany of war crimes and violations of international law and human rights during Operation Cast Lead, and after the Palestine, Palestinian um, Center for Human Rights filed 490 separate criminal complaints to Israeli authorities on behalf of 1,046 victims, but these were ignored. Instead, the Israeli military conducted its own internal investigation and it exonerated itself. In our lexicon, post 9-11 especially, cops and soldiers are heroes. And what they do is always framed as security, in other words, as acts of self-defense. Police are in the streets to protect and serve the citizenry from black criminals out of control. This is why in every instance, there's an effort to depict the victim as assailant. Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Darren Hunt, uh, the sidewalk is a weapon. Their big bodies are weapons. They lunge, they glare, they flare their arms. Uh, they, their bodies are weapons, right? And as we speak, police officers are changing stories, transforming the victims into perpetrators. In Israel-Palestine, wars of pacification and annihilation are branded Operation Cast Lead, an attempt to neutralize the threat of terrorism. Operation Protective Edge, or Iron Dome. The blockade of Gaza is presented as necessary for Israel's security. For people who live under occupation, they experience the world as victims of perpetual war, right? As we saw in that clip. Um, most reasonable people know that the attack on Gaza was not about the kidnapping of three Israeli students or the so-called terror tunnels running from Gaza Strip uh, into Israel. As Norman Finkelstein uh, recently pointed out, Israel could have easily sealed off the tunnels from within their own borders without firing a shot. The war was, as we heard, uh, an act of aggressive collective punishment, a blatant violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, intended to intimidate Palestinians for supporting Hamas, undermine prospects for unity government, completely disarm the territory, and tighten its control of the occupation. One can argue that the killing of Mike Brown and the manner in which the police left his corpse on the street uncovered for four hours was also an act of collective punishment. This is the point of lynching. 
The public display of the tortured corpse was intended to terrorize the entire community, to punish everyone into submission, to remind others of their fate if they step out of line. Collective punishment takes other forms as well. In 2013, 92% of searches and 86% of traffic stops in Ferguson involved black people. This, despite the fact that one in three white people was found carrying illegal weapons or drugs, while one in five blacks had contraband. Uh, similar statistics can be replicated across the country. We know that five times as many white people use illegal drugs as African Americans, and yet black people are sent to prison on drug charges at uh, ten times the rate of whites. This brings me to what I feel in my final point uh, is a very, um, actually two more points, very disturbing trend. Um, one, uh, that is distinguishing between the uh, deserving and undeserving dead. Okay? There's a marked tendency to turn the Mike Browns and Trayvon Martins in, t in the world into good kids, college-bound, honor students, sweet, as if their character is the only evidence they have of their innocence. Yeah. Right? The fact is, even someone with a dozen felony convictions and sacks his pants to his knees or wears her skirt to her hips, has a right to due process, mm -hmm. and according to the law, is supposed to be presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Habeas corpus isn't just for the innocent or the good, it is, and I'm talking to law students, right? It is for the person who committed the worst crimes. It is not limited to the U.S. and should not protect people from being killed by unmanned drones, especially if no war has been declared. It bears repeating that it was, uh, that, that we demand a protection under the law. Instead, it is the police that are unlawful, the source of disorder, violating the Constitution, fundamental clauses in the Fifth Amendment to due process, First Amendment rights of media to investigate and tell stories, and the right to assembly. Right? One quick last point. As we sit in the law school, I think it is only appropriate to invoke Dred Scott in part because his name was dropped um, often during the, the Ferguson protests. While many people simply quoted uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney's infamous line that black people had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that's all over the internet, we missed the central point. That is, that the Dred Scott decision essentially rendered the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional and opened the door to make slavery legal everywhere. Okay, and you know that for the law students, right? In other words, it proved that the U.S. federal government was complicit in upholding slavery. And this is the very thing that convinced John Brown to turn what would have been a guerrilla war against southern slaveholders into attack on the federal government, right? Now, remembering Dred Scott is, and thinking about this in terms of, of, of militarization of the police, supported by the federal government, um, written into law uh, in part by President Obama signing the National Defense Authorization Act, make, making the hardware available. Uh, the fact is that there's a kind of general consensus from the federal government in support of uh, militarization. And despite all this, uh, all this happening, people still go, you know, buy the, the okie doke that somehow the Justice Department is a savior, that the federal government will be the savior. You know, and we could talk more about that in discussion, but it kind of reminds me in terms of parallels to Rashid Khalidi's important book, Brokers of Deceit, uh, which challenges the idea that AIPAC and the Israel lobby are the only thing stopping the U.S. from a just policy toward Israel-Palestine. Uh, but he shows, you know, the U.S. government has been a key part of the problem, independent of the lobby. So when will we wake up and realize that the, f <laughs> the government is not our, our friends, not the friends of justice? You know, it's not going to save us. Uh, so I don't have a conclusion, but I just want to leave you with a slogan. Um, that is, a go back to surrealist, um, the revolution surrealist number two, 1925, and the injunction was open the prisons, disband the army. Thank you. In light of the subject matter and our time constraints, I think we've done remarkably well in staying to time, but nonetheless, we are slightly over time in terms of what we had hoped to accomplish by way of Q&A. So what I'm going to suggest is that folks stay in their seats, raise their hands, just for the interest of time to not go through the rigmarole of trying to come up. But let me just remind you of two things. The first is that 
We invite questions and comments, but we ask you to restrict them to one minute. I'll recognize hands with a priority given to students who raise their hands. And finally, just in the interest of everyone being able to hear the question, I'm going to repeat each question to ensure that the panelists are keenly aware of what has been asked. So with that, I open the floor for questions. Um, okay, so I'll start with you again. I'm priority to students, but I'm going to make an effort to get around to everyone. Go ahead. Loud, just speak loudly, identify yourself in one minute. I just want to apologize. My, my name is Murat Yildiz, I'm a student in the history department. Um, so I, I want to bring together two points that Shireen said he was making and Robin Kelly, and that is about um, referencing also an article that Maya Magdashi has written, and that is the kind of narration of uh, the killing of Palestinians. And that is, we notice that um, figures are get bad figures of men, women, and children. Right. And, you know, clearly what you find a lot of uh, writers doing is, is presenting the, 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 the killing of children as more the reprehensible and heinous crimes, but what we have, what we have is the fact that the killing of men uh, as somehow being right. more understandable. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could kind of reflect on that and how, you know, men, Palestinian men, and men of color are potentially in themselves as being men more violent and dangerous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just to repeat the question, it focuses on the depiction of individuals who, uh, who were subject to violence in, in Gaza in this particular instance, and the depiction of men, women, and children differently to the extent that they were um, victimized with children being represented as uh, kind of the killing of children as a heinous act, but the killing of men in particular, and men of color more generally to connect Gaza to a broader narrative, being represented as a somehow more legitimate form of killing. And the question was directed to uh, Professor Se'eli and Kelly. Um, I'll be very brief. Actually, I took that out of my talk. Um, <laughs> When I talk about this, our focus on spectacular violence, and the spectacular violence in terms of generating empathy for a kind of you know, international human rights discourse always focuses on the killing of children, mm -hmm. killing of women, specifically children. And it's interesting because part, there's two things here, because you raise a really important question. Uh, one, the way in which we take even mo men of color who are minors and don't grant them the nomenclature of children, like the, the position of being children, for example. That's one thing. The flip side to that is that, you know, we end up, it ends up choking other parts of a conversation. And that is, uh, we know why they do this, because all men are considered combatants, mm -hmm. right? Now, let's, let's just take, you know, one big leap and say, well, what about combatants? Mm -hmm. Once we, once we take combatants out of the story, we basically said that we can't even have a conversation about the justifiable right to self-defense. Mm -hmm. right. And that, and I took it out because I felt if I brought it up, I, you know, in, in two seconds it would be very hard to deal with. Uh, because, you know, because a, a lot of people do come to the movement. I wrote about this in, in um, the piece I did in, I forget where it came out. It's called When the Smoke Clear, Mondo Weiss. Mm -hmm. um, but I talk a little bit about the problems of spectacular violence and, and when we will actually move beyond that and how it can sustain a movement. Um, so I completely agree with you, and we need to actually think about it both in terms of, um, of getting away from just an empathetic to the question of justice and and also recognizing that the violence of the state is what's illegal, you know, among other things. But I want to um, Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, uh, plug Maya's piece, which is, Can Palestinian Men Be Victims?, which I think was a really good way to pose the question, right? Um, and, and I wanted to also really briefly reflect on how these questions um, continue to be resonant 
um, over decades. So when September 11 happened, a group of us at NYU, um, across different kinds of activist networks, put together a series of events called Who is the Public Enemy? Um, in which we were talking about the category of the terrorist, the, ter the category of the criminal, the category, all of these different categories I think that we have to dismantle. But for the law students, um, and I'm, you know, um, forgive me because I am jet lagged, but um, there was a wonderful article that came out recently that did a history of the very category of the civilian, um, which has its own colonial genealogy and actually referred to British colonial officials. Um, so, right, these are all things, um, as Professor Ke Kelly is saying, that we have to be really critical in understanding um, their historical genealogies and their relationship to the category of the human. Okay, go ahead, in the back. I have a question. Why is this, I was only focused on Israel and demonizing the United States people when you have not brought up Hajimin al-Husseini, founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, who also screamed the holy war against the Jews in 1948, was the uncle of Yasser Arafat, and basically promoted most of the jihad, and he even, he even killed the intellectuals of Palestine. I mean... This, this has gone into history of a false narrative, and I want to know why haven't you included this? anything from his ties to Francois Genot, who was Hitler's banker, who bankrolled Panini, the free people of the Liberate Palestine movement. Um, the Munich massacre was all funded through Francis Genot, Hitler's uh, banker, go, and this money went not only to the Muslim Brotherhood and, as I said, Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamists, but also to neo-Nazi factions. And this is history. So the question is about a historical figure in Palestine, Haj Amin al-Husseini, and his alleged ties to Nazi movements, and further the ongoing ties between Palestinian intellectuals or Palestinian activists and those kinds of neo-Nazi formations. And Francois Junot. Okay, so I just want to get that out there. I, it's been registered. Uh, and I think it was open to the entire panel, okay. so I invite anyone to respond who would be interested. I mean, I feel like that's on me, but yeah, anybody who'd like to respond. Okay, so um, Hajamin and Husseini um, did not establish the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, that would be giving him way more credit than he deserves. No, the Muslim Brotherhood was actually founded in Egypt in the 1920s by a man named Hassan al-Banna. Uh, where it's, you've had your opportunity, and I'm just asking you to be respectful in the response. Just please, please, you've asserted facts, and now you've invited the panelists to respond, and we're going to invite that response. Um, okay, so in my reading of the historical, Haj Amin al-Husseini was not an, actually involved in the establishment of, of the Muslim Brotherhood, and in fact, he spent most of his career under British colonial rule as a British um, paid official. Um, he was... Again, you can take up additional questions after the panel, but we've we've offered you the floor, and now no, no, no further. For the Nazi Party, he went to Auschwitz to watch the Jews. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to stop. You already made that point, and we're going to ask the panelists to address it. Okay, so let me address the crux of the point, um, which is Haj Amin al Husseini's, who is basically an elite figure aligned with the British, um, who was then, who was then um, sort of because of the 1936-1939 revolt, which similar to the rebellions that have happened in the last three years, was a ground up movement um, that was actually um, very critical of the elite. And in my work, as you seem to sort of suggest, um, there's a lot of space to be critical of the elite, of the Arab elite, and there's a great deal of space to be critical of Arab authoritarianism. And in fact, I did mention um, Arab authoritarianism in my talk. Um, there's only so much, you know, that in 15 minutes when you're asked to make a broad comparison that you can talk about. But I've published on this broadly, and I'm happy to talk to you at length about my critique of Palestinian elites, which I'm publishing a book on that will be out in the fall. Um, in addition, the question of Haj Amin al um alliance and dabbling with um, the Hitler's regime, yes, 
yes that's true he did go to um he did make an alliance he did after he was um uh expelled from palestine in 1939 he did go to iraq and like many people in the arab world and in um the broader colonial world um made alliances with the axis and i think this is um a history that actually has been critiqued by palestinian um scholars and historians and many um and many um broader um, uh, historians of the Arab world and I'll be happy to talk to you more about that um, and about the growing critique um, that I myself and, and many of my colleagues um, are involved in which is a critique of um, any form of anti-Semitism my principled stand and the way I've been teaching in Cairo has been that the only way that you can be in solidarity with Palestine in a principled sense is to reject racism of any sort and um, primary among those is rejecting anti-Semitism. I'm going to have to ask you to yeah, stop well, because it's yeah, been one minute. Say, that's I to Thank you. And I'm not going to repeat this because there was no question there, but in terms of questions, I'm now going to give the priority to uh, students. I do see you, sir, but I'm going to just take a moment to allow students to collect their thoughts. We're really very keen to have questions or comments from the students who are in the audience. Go ahead, sir. So again, I'm going to summarize as best I can without taking a minute. Um, so a reference to uh, Fanon's view or position that the colonized are always presumed guilty, connecting to the first question, noting that 
recipients of state violence who are viewed as illegitimate targets or who are vulnerable or understood to be illegitimately attacked are routinely characterized as unarmed and the notion of any form of resistance is thereby delegitimated so that if you are capable of resistance or if you express resistance that becomes a basis of legitimate state violence and if that is an appropriate framing or if that's a framing that is in fact in currency how does that connect to the presentations we've heard about both Gaza and Ferguson? Again, open. Yeah, Professor March. Could I respond to that? Um, thank you for that question. I think that um, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but periodizing some of the expansion of the police state in the United States in the last 50 years, I think, helps answer your question. You know, in this period of the building up, the creation of SWAT in 1967, which was composed of all Vietnam veterans and is first deployed against the Black Panther Party in 69, that it's deployed against an armed a, 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 a group that supports armed self-defense and the public discourse of armed self-defense was a possible one. You know, it's um, talked about in conjunction with the Cuban Revolution, with the anti-colonial movements that are sweeping the world, even with the Maoist Revolution. So it's happening, that's what I was referring to when I was talking about the era of the Cold War, where you really see a contestation, especially in the Global South, in which armed liberation movements are really popular inside the United States and are models. You know, this is how Che Guevara becomes a popular icon. So the political culture is different, also the level of state repression, I say this as a historian of the Black Panther Party, is much less than it is today. So one thing I'm really struck by is that if I had to draw sort of a broad schemata of increased militarization, because I do think there has been an increase in the apparatus, not only in the hardware, but in the legal technologies of prosecution, as well as the number of cages, that this is an apparatus that's getting larger and larger, and it's really been a net that's been closing. I would start by talking about this in, in the modern period, this intensification, counterinsurgency against the social movements of the 60s and 70s, the expansion with the war on drugs, the first and second war on drugs, first the Rockefeller drug laws, but especially the Reagan-Bush era laws. So this is where you begin to see mandatory minimums, three strikes laws, um, all of the kinds of new legal technologies uh, for criminalizing gang participation, gang injunctions, as well as gang enhancements. And I think that in that period in the 1980s where the term street terrorism is being used laid a lot of the legal groundwork for the war on terror post 9-11. So the war on drugs is a missing component of this discussion. And when I was meeting with people in Ferguson, this is one of the class questions about people mobilizing in Ferguson, is that legal status is very significant. In other words, do you have a felony conviction or not? And many, many people do. And that is something that plays itself out in how people are able to protest when they're, they're facing constant police surveillance. And the final thing I wanted to say that's directly related to um, Ferguson is that among the organized protesters who are literally, they're out there tonight protesting, and it's cold in St. Louis. Uh, they are out every night, and they plan to be out every night until January 7th. Something they were very angry about, and they, I heard this point made repeatedly, that despite the personnel carriers, the tanks, the M16s, the looters were never stopped. That the National Guard stood right. by and watched as the quick mart was looted. And I followed the entire, I had actually pictures of it, but didn't have time to show it, the entire route of the looters. And this is, this is remarkable. And it went directly towards another black community called Delwood. So they had an analysis about essentially police strategies of allowing looting to really displace the political focus of the protesters themselves. So I think that this retreat from armed struggle is a response to this vastly expanded apparatus, which we're really just beginning to even understand how wide and deep it is inside the United States. Mm -hmm. I just had one quick addition to Donna's very excellent sort of, I think, mini history of thinking about the growth of the national security apparatus, and that is the growth of the apparatus of immigration detention, which is itself a, another major way in which the state <coughs> has expanded its role in sort of policing and so forth, and has had its significant impact in terms of changing the rules of the game in the context of criminal procedure itself. That, so. <coughs> Okay, so once again, with a priority for students, I'm going to just take a pause. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much for presenting here tonight. Um, I'm a graduate student of Chicago Academy of Studies here at UCLA, and I think um, one of the things that I just kind of find to work is there's so much to take in tonight. Um, but I find to be honest, the term of statelessness and how people kept describing that. So I'm really interested in that. Maybe speaking a little bit more about people's comments or testimonies uh, about statelessness and how they got to that. Um, and for Shireen, uh, I caught on to the arc 
The question, um, which is to Professors Murch and Se'eli, focuses on particular terms that were used in trying to describe the conditions um, in these presentations. First, on the ground in Ferguson from activists, this notion of statelessness and what were they trying to capture? How did they come to this idea? What did the idea entail? And then, in the case of Professor Se'eli's um, presentation, the notion of an archive of decolonization and laying out in some more detail what would be in that archive. Um, I, I think, thank you for your question. I think this also links to the earlier question, um, which I was really stu struck by um, your um, the clip about the trees, because one of the things that happens every day in Palestine is the uprooting of olive trees, right? Um, as sort of a basic kind of function of people's political economy. Um, and and, and um, I, I I'm always really struck by how Israeli, sort of the Israeli public state rhetoric around security, security, security. And my basic point around that would be, as long as you're occupying people and you're denying them citizenship and you're uprooting their trees and you're denying them access to water and basic services and mobility, you're not going to be secure. It's, it's, it, it sounds like a simple formula. Um, and, and, and I think this is the archive that I'm talking about and I think that, you know, I sort of started with this 1936-1939 revolt which um, some people have called um, uh, the first intifada or uprising. Um, but there are, pe there are people now looking at earlier moments under actually Egyptian rule in the, in the late, um, in the, in the mid-19th century. Um, and I think that sort of in response to uh, the gentleman who was asking about Hajimin, um, took off, but I think that there is a value actually in, in, in being very critical of state of, of parastate leadership within this context. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to see in the archive is the way that the Palestinian kind of political movement, in particular during um, the last four years, what happened with the uprisings, the Arab uprisings, as part of this archive, is the way that it disclosed how the Palestinian Authority, on the one hand, was so complicit in broader Arab authoritarian regimes because they lost their main ally, which was Hosni Mubarak, and Hamas, who lost their main ally, which was Bashar al-Assad. And to me, this was a real moment of thinking about okay how do we think about liberation in this moment and 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 so I think that one of the things um, that, that we really need to do because we saw so many possibilities of, of hope and change in the Arab world and, and even though things feel so very dark at this moment is to really take seriously that kind of self-critical impulse I mean I think you know, I really get very tired of having to constantly prove that I'm human before I have to speak. You know what I mean? Like this constant sort of like, no, I'm human too, and we're, you know, no, we're good people, and it's okay to, you know, we're not all crazy, you know. And and it, there's just has to be a way for us to get out of that, and maybe the way to do it is to really be very committed to our own self-critical process. Um, I think people talking about statelessness, um, first it has to do with uh, what that um, pastor articulated about the right to exist, that many people feel that they don't even have the right to exist. So this constant threat of violence, that image of the body in the street, that this could be you. So that you have no constitutional rights, you have no protection, the constitution doesn't apply to you, you are not a citizen. And I think for people in St. Louis who are in the shadow of the, Dred, of the court where the Dred Scott decision was decided, this is profoundly meaningful to them. I also think it's a very practical question uh, in addition to this threat of constant violence. It's also the political economy of policing that's happening in Ferguson where it makes it very difficult people for, to cross from the city into the county. So there are all these examples of people whose children may live in the county, but they are afraid to go into the county because literally to drive along West Florissant, which is the line that where you saw people protesting and also a portion of it's looted, just to drive along West Florissant is to get a traffic ticket or a warrant. So um, the second largest source of revenue in Ferguson are these uh, warrants that are being issued almost entirely to the black population. So it's um, a combination of the threat of violence and this uh, 
I don't know what to call it. It's a combination of a, a race, of a race and a poverty tax because people don't pay their warrants, then in turn the fines accumulate. So I think that it's um, uh, the police are not there to protect and serve, the constant threat of violence, and then the constant extraction of, of money and the constant extraction of wealth. And I think that one thing I'd like to add to this is thinking about the political economy of race. You know, so often we separate race and class, and you can't understand what's happened in Ferguson without looking at race as a deeply economic structure related to state violence and state punishment. Okay, so I think that we have actually run out of time. We had one last, for the final questions, perhaps you could come up and address the panelists directly. I apologize, but we did agree to end at 8.30. Please join me in thanking these panelists. And <laughs>